Well, today we are continuing on in our unit, looking at different ethical issues. But this time we're looking at the ethics of capital punishment. Bless you. What is capital punishment? Anybody know? The death penalty. The death penalty, what do you mean by that? Uh, when Bless you. someone is sentenced by the courts to death for their crimes instead of jail time. Right. Capital punishment is, well, legal punishment that involves killing a person, right? This has been something that's practiced in a lot of different societies, a lot of different cultures. Today we're going to be looking at a defense of it. And the thinker, Lewis Podgman, is going to be providing two different arguments for the justifiability of the death penalty. Let's see if you all agree with him. Lewis Podgman was an American philosopher who wrote on a wide range of ethical issues. That is, he was known for his work in applied ethics. And he's somebody who, within recent history, has tried to make philosophical and logical arguments on a religious basis. I believe he actually uh, ended up going to seminary um, and used those experiences to help motivate his philosophy. A lot of his writings nowadays are used for educational purposes and for introductory classes like this. So this particular piece is going to be really good for our purposes in introducing y'all to just a bunch of ethical issues that we face today in our society. Now, Podgman brings up two arguments that he tries to use to defend the death penalty or capital punishment in this article. He provides what he calls a forward-looking defense and a backward-looking defense. And both of these arguments are, well, they're going to try to justify the death penalty in different ways. The backward-looking defense, which we might say is more deontological in nature, says that, look, there are some punishments that we ought to dish out to people because that is simply the right thing to do. That is what's just. That's what it means to, to engage in the establishment of justice in some sense. So people will sometimes try to justify the death penalty by saying there are some crimes that humans can commit that are just deserving of death. And that these people forfeit their right to life by engaging in this heinous crime or set of crimes. So the argument goes, since some people just deserve to be punished for what they do and some crimes are so heinous, that the person who committed them is deserving of death, the death penalty is justified in these cases. This is what Podgman calls the backward-looking defense. But he also provides what we might call a utilitarian argument for the death penalty. And this is one that you've probably heard before. Has anybody here heard of the deterrence theory of punishment? What is that about? Can somebody enlighten the class? Yeah. If there's enough punishment and you know that that punishment could happen, then it could serve as a great deterrent for your possibility to commit crime. Right. So, so the general idea is this. Look, if people see that if they do bad things, they get punished, that might prevent people from committing crimes in the future. It will deter them from committing crimes because they'll be worried about the punishment they'll receive as a result. So the forward-looking defense argues punishment does often serve as a reliable deterrent to crime, including the death penalty. If people see that, look, if they commit a certain crime, they'll be killed, 
that is going to deter them from doing that kind of stuff. Thus, capital punishment is justified on the grounds that it deters people from committing crimes. It prevents murders and rapes and all these terrible things from taking place because people fear what will happen to them. These are the two basic arguments that are often given in favor of the death penalty. In this article, Podgeman is going to put forth both of these arguments, a forward-looking defense and a backward-looking one. And he's going to try to argue that both arguments make sense and they're sound. This is a uh, technical philosophy word that means the argument is both valid and it's true. But we don't have to get into all that right now. In any case, he's going to... He's going to argue both of these arguments are true and they're valid. And he's going to try to defend this combined view that he's going to make based on these two arguments from a few different objections. So that's basically what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at how Podgeman supports both of these arguments and how his combined account, how he defends that from various objections. Sound good? Cool. All right. Well, then let's get into it. The first argument that he gives, this backward-looking defense, is based on a theory of punishment known as retributivism. Retributivism is the view that, look, wrongdoers deserve to be punished proportional to their crimes, and that this is the just thing to do what it means to have a just society in some sense is to punish people in ways that are proportional to their ethical wrongdoings this theory of punishment is known as retributivism it's been around for a long time people just have this intuition they just have this belief that look sometimes people deserve to be punished for what they do that's what justice looks like so the backward-looking defense is based on this theory of punishment, that some people just deserve to be punished in virtue of what they do. Podgeman wants to distinguish this theory of punishment from personal revenge. A lot of people say that, oh, the reason why we punish people in society is just because we're motivated to enact vengeance on them and Podgeman says no like sure sometimes people do try to enact vengeance but what undergirds a lot of punishments is just this belief that it's just to punish people so this theory of punishment is not the same as personal revenge they're two different things those who believe in retributivism just think that punishment involves carrying out justice. That is what justice looks like. At the end of the day, people should get what they deserve, in other words. According to this theory of punishment, Podgeman argues, look, sometimes people commit such heinous crimes that the punishment that they deserve is death. So, he says, the death penalty is a fitting response to some of the terrible things that we see in society. Some people are deserving of being killed for what they've done. So, it makes sense why we allow it in some instances, why we carry it out in some instances. Because, he argues, that's the just thing to do. So this is the first argument that he brings forth to defend capital punishment. The second one is going to be based on that deterrence theory that we already talked about. It's going to be associated with that forward-looking defense. Whereas some people argue that we should punish people because that's the just thing to do, other people might think the reason that we should punish people 
is because it produces good consequences. That is, it prevents further crimes from being committed. It prevents our society from dissolving into chaos and instability. So, deterrence is the theory of punishment that argues that punishing wrongdoers deters people from committing crimes. And that's why we should punish people. That's why it's justified to punish people, because punishing people actually makes society better off in the long run. Thus, the people who believe in this theory of punishment will bring a bunch of data to bear on this issue to support this idea. They'll say, look, talk to people who work in law enforcement, talk to people who have, you know, looked at social trends and crime stats as a result of having the death penalty, as the result of exercising it in society. And they'll say, there is data, there's statistics to support the idea that the death penalty does serve as a good deterrent. It does deter crimes. Thus, because empirically we can show that the death penalty prevents crimes, there's data to back this up, people will argue, thus capital punishment is justified. Look, we have real evidence that it deters crimes, so it's a justified thing that we do. Makes sense. This is obviously a very utilitarian analysis, right? Whereas the first argument is more based on principle. What is just involves punishing people. This one is all about being concerned with the consequences. The reason why the death penalty is justified on this argument is, well, because it produces good consequences for our society. Makes sense? You understand kind of the two different arguments here? One being based on what we think justice is, the other being consequentialist. Of course, things are not as cut and dry as we might think, though, especially in regards to the death penalty. While we can find evidence and statistics and data to back up this idea that capital punishment does serve as a good deterrent, taken as a whole, Podgman concedes that it's kind of ambiguous whether or not the death penalty is as effective as a lot of proponents think it is. So if you look at the literature, you'll find evidence that shows the death penalty is a good deterrent, and you'll find sources that say it's actually not a good deterrent. So it's a little bit ambiguous whether or not it is a good deterrent here. Another thing to keep in mind about supporting the death penalty, especially this second argument, is that we cannot in principle know how many lives it does save, right? That isn't something that we could know, right? We, in fact, it's kind of hard to figure out how many lives it would fail to save if we didn't have the death penalty in our society because we wouldn't really have much to compare it to. Right? So there are certain ways of looking at this issue that reveal it is kind of complex. There's data to support both sides. We can't really know how many lives it saves, so that should cause us to rethink whether or not it is that useful. But if we are concerned, about saving lives, if we do think that the death penalty is a good deterrent, Podgman brings up a bunch of things that we could actually be doing as a society in order to make sure the death penalty serves as a good deterrent. If this is something that we can believe, uh, believe in and something that we actually want to engage in, there are ways that we could be doing it better, he says. And he lists a few of these. One of the things that we could do in order to make sure capital punishment functions as a deterrent 
is we could have speedier trials. As I'm sure you've heard and seen in the media, perhaps experienced, a lot of the trial processes in the U.S. are very drawn out, right? Trials can take weeks, months, even years, right, to finish. Well, if we did think the death penalty would serve as a good deterrent, one of the things that we could do is we could speed up our trial process. This would actually cause people to, well, internalize the idea that their crimes might be deserving of death, they might be facing death, and it would actually instill the fear of the law and punishment in people. Another thing that we could do that Podgeman brings up to ensure that the death penalty functions as a deterrent is we could have a more limited appeals process. If we are really sure that somebody committed some heinous crime, what use or value is there in allowing them to appeal the verdict? If we have proof, let's say, beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody did a bunch of heinous things and we think that you know death is a fitting punishment for them, maybe we shouldn't give them a bunch of opportunities to appeal their sentence. So that's another thing that we could discuss. Another kind of uh, grotesque idea that Hodgman brings up is, look, if you want to make the death penalty a better deterrent, why don't we start having more public executions? That would really instill fear in people, right? Imagine, you know, you have somebody who has, let's say, raped and murdered 15 people and they're finally caught. And we decide, oh, maybe, you know, death is a fitting punishment for them. What might deter people from doing that kind of stuff in the future? Maybe lopping their head off in the town square so everybody can see. Rather than just doing it behind closed doors in a walled room where only certain people are invited to see it. Finally, in this kind of gets to one of the points I just mentioned. If we were concerned about the death penalty being a good deterrent, we could vary our method of execution. Some people, well, and this has happened, um, might be under the idea that our current methods of execution are not that effective. Some people have survived how we execute people in the US. If our primary concern was making sure that capital punishment is a good deterrent, we could kill people in perhaps a faster, more effective, more grotesque way. And the shock of this might make it a better deterrent. What do you think? Do these reasons make sense? These ideas make sense? I'm not asking you whether or not you agree we should have the death penalty. Do you think maybe engaging in this stuff would make it a better deterrent? Does that seem rational to you? Okay. Okay. So, so far, you're with him. But Podgeman also provides a third argument for the death penalty in this piece. One that isn't confined to the forward or the backward looking defense. It's kind of an argument just based on logic. He talks about this in the context of what a lighthouse does for ships. We cannot know how many ships lighthouses save, right, on the coast of the US. But it's rational to think that they do save some ships, right? Even though we can't know in principle how many. Would it be rational for us to keep up lighthouses and keep them working? Or would it be more rational for us to just assume that they don't work and tear them all down? Or keep them unmanned? <coughs> 
Podgman is going to say, look, it's rational to bet that lighthouses are effective. In an analogous way, it's rational to bet that the death penalty is a good deterrent. This is what's known as the best bet argument. Even though we don't know for certain that the death penalty deters future crimes, we should bet that it does. It's rational to bet that it does, especially given the idea that we have some sort of moral and social obligation to save people if we can, right? And to help them out if we can, to make their lives better if we can. Thus, even though we can't in principle know how many lives the death penalty saves, we are in part responsible for the innocent lives that would be lost if we stopped supporting the death penalty and if we got rid of it, right? We obviously don't want innocent lives to be lost, so it's rational to still exercise capital punishment. What's the alternative? Sometimes, in very rare instances, we get it wrong and kill someone. That's bad. But in the vast majority of instances, we kill somebody that society generally doesn't think is a good person anyway. So is much really lost by having capital punishment in our society? The best bet argument would say we're probably gaining a lot more by having it in our society than we're losing. So we should bet that you know, it's an effective good practice, that it's doing us some good. Does this make sense? OK, cool. Here's what Podgman has to say about this third argument. Suppose we choose a policy of capital punishment for capital crimes. That is, crimes in which somebody murdered another, or several people, whatever. In this case, we are betting that the death of some murderers will be more than compensated for by the lives of some innocents not being murdered, either by these murderers or by others who would have murdered. If we are right, we have saved the lives of the innocent. If we are wrong, we have, unfortunately, sacrificed the lives of some murderers. But say we choose not to have a social policy of capital punishment. If capital punishment doesn't work as a deterrent, we've come out ahead. But if it does work, then we've missed the opportunity to save innocent lives. If we value the saving of innocent lives more highly than we do the loss of the guilty, then to bet on a policy of capital punishment seems rational. Since the innocent have a greater right to life than the guilty, it is our moral duty to adopt a policy that has a chance of protecting them from potential murderers. Thus, it seems like our social, our moral duty to protect innocent life outweighs our social and moral duty to make murderers' lives better off, or to not kill them, I guess. Of course, there are a lot of other arguments that we can bring to bear on this issue, right? Arguments against the death penalty or against capital punishment. This is not an issue that people are all agreed upon, right? And there are good arguments on the other side. Let's now talk about some of the ones that Podgman discusses in this article. There are others, and we will bring them up in conversation, but he looks just at a few at the end of the article here. The first argument he considers is that capital punishment actually in the US, for example, it's just a sorry excuse for revenge. That's really what it is. If we look at the psychologies of the people that support capital punishment and carry it out, what we'll find is they just want to get revenge on people that they think are bad. That's what's actually motivating this policy. Well, the thing is we can't really see into the minds of people 
We can't really know that this is true for certain. But regardless of that, retributivism, the theory of punishment that we first looked at, is different than a thirst of revenge. We can argue about the psychologies of the people that engage in this practice, but the kind of capital punishment that Ponchman is supporting in this article is one that is based on retributivism, not revenge. Okay, Podgman doesn't think revenge is good. He is not advocating for a version of capital punishment that is based on revenge. So he's saying this objection doesn't even really respond to what I'm saying here. Thus, he would say, the kind of capital punishment that I'm trying to defend is one based on impersonal justice. So the objection doesn't really have to do with anything I'm saying. Similarly, if the punishment doesn't address whether or not people should be punished or what punishment they should receive as a result of their crimes. So it's not very informative. It doesn't really help us discover what it is that we should do in situations in which people commit heinous crimes. We can argue about the psychologies of people, but it's clear Podgman is not arguing for a revenge-driven practice. He's arguing for what he thinks is a just practice. The next objection he considers is one that has to do with, well, one from religion, one from Christianity. It's been argued by some people, Christians and non-Christians alike, that, well, the death penalty may be justified, but humans don't have the authority to carry it out. Okay? These people are going to say, if you read the Bible, what the Bible says is God alone has the authority to decide who lives and who dies. So it's not cool, it's not justifiable that we take that into our own hands and kill people. Even if in principle it's right. God is the ultimate arbiter of life and death. We should leave it up to him because we don't have the authority to make the decision. Well, Podgman doesn't think this is a very good argument either. And he doesn't think it's actually biblically supported. He brings up some passages in the New Testament in which the writers discuss how government is essentially authority on earth placed there by God. So there's an argument to be made that Actually, God has placed on earth certain people that are supposed to act and make decisions on his behalf in the earthly realm. Government has such authority, according to some verses. Thus, the government has the authority to punish people, including killing someone if they do something particularly heinous. One verse that you may know says something like, the government does not bear the sword for nothing. The idea being, the government can punish people on God's behalf in a just and authoritative, justifiable way. If we want to look at this kind of from a non-religious or a secular standpoint, Podgman says, look, we give the government, we give the state a monopoly on force and violence anyway. Part of what it means to live in the society in which we do and have the government in which we do is to give the authority to punish and enforce the law to the government. That's what we do. That's how we live and act. That's why we don't think being a vigilante is acceptable or legal, right? So even on a secular understanding, 
the state does have the authority to dispense punishment anyway and to try to establish justice in our society. So, like the first objection, he doesn't think this one is that good. He considers two more. The third one has to do with, well, look, humans are imperfect. The death penalty is not something we should support because mistakes happen and we have killed innocent people in the past. And that's bad. And look, we don't want to kill innocent people even if perhaps it does deter some crimes, the fact that we do kill innocent people does not outweigh that. Like, we have a, a, a moral obligation to not kill innocent people first and foremost. So, the objection goes, the death penalty shouldn't be allowed because mistakes happen, innocent people have been executed, and this is not cool, this is not defensible. Oh, Podgeman has an interesting response to this. He agrees in some sense that yes, it is terrible that innocent people have been executed. That is not a good thing. But he says this objection actually does not discuss the justifiability of the death penalty itself. What the people who bring up this objection are critiquing is how we exercise capital punishment. And Poshman says, yes, I agree. There are problems that societies have in exercising it, yes. But in principle, this objection has nothing to say about whether or not capital punishment is good or bad. It just says, look, the way that we currently do it is bad. And Poshman is like, yes, I agree. The way that we currently do it sometimes is bad. But I'm not talking about the way that we currently do it. I'm talking about the principle Logically, is the death penalty justifiable or unjustifiable? And he's going to say this objection does not ask that question at all. It doesn't try to determine that. So he says the occasional mistake, first of all, is not grounds enough to ban it for utilitarian reasons, for consequentialist reasons. And it's not really getting to the heart of the issue, he thinks. He's trying to logically defend the idea or the practice, not our messy application of it. So does his response here make sense? He brings up two reasons that he thinks it's not a good objection. One, first of all, it actually does serve as a good deterrent, and so the benefits outweigh the harms. So that's a utilitarian reason. But then the second reason is, look, he's like, this objection isn't actually responding to what I'm saying. It's not actually questioning whether the death penalty in principle is justifiable or not. Just or not. Finally, he looks at one more objection to this view. This one has to do, again, with the application of capital punishment. Some people argue that the death penalty is unjustifiable. It should be abolished because it discriminates against certain social groups, certain classes of people. That is, in the past, it has been used to discriminate against people who are poor, disabled, and non-white. And on those grounds, because it's been used for discriminatory purposes, it's not justifiable. We should get rid of it. It's just another tool in the arsenal of racists that they can use to continue to disadvantage other groups. Well, what do you think Podgeman is going to say? He has a similar response to this objection as he did for the last one. He says, yes, I agree. It's been used in the past for discriminatory purposes and that this ain't good. 
Yes, in the past it's been used to discriminate against poor people, disabled people, black people. And he's going to say, that isn't good. Yes, that's immoral. But again, he's going to say, I'm not talking about whether or not our current application of it is perfect. I'm talking about it in principle. I'm trying to provide arguments that it is a justifiable practice in principle on logical grounds. Not that it's being abused. He's going to say, I agree, sometimes it's being abused. That's not good. But that's not what the heart of the issue is. Is it defendable or indefensible in principle? And then he brings up one more reason against this subjection. He basically says, just because it's been abused in the past doesn't mean that we should get rid of it. If we had to get rid of every law that has been abused in our country, we wouldn't have any laws left. So we shouldn't just get rid of laws because they have been abused. That would be disastrous for society. That by itself is not a good enough criterion for abolishing this. We need to look at the whole picture. We need to look at whether or not it is a good deterrent, whether or not it is just, all of these other factors. So we shouldn't just toss it out because it's been abused. That's not good enough reason to abolish this practice. So in sum, what Podgeman tries to do in this article is he tries to defend capital punishment and defend it from various objections. He uses two arguments to support it. One, a utilitarian argument. It deters crime, which is a good for our society. And two, a more principled argument. That, look, in some cases, the just thing to do is kill somebody who's done something particularly bad. That is what justice looks like. Those are the two arguments that he tries to use to support this practice. He agrees that, look, we haven't applied it perfectly. He agrees that it's bad, that innocent people have died, that it's been used for discriminatory purposes. But he doesn't think that we should throw it out just on those grounds. So what do you all think? Do you agree with him? Do you think that the death penalty is ever justified? Why do you think it's justified, Brian? In certain cases where we have undeniable proof, and undeniable proof is something we can argue about later, but we have undeniable proof that someone has committed a heinous act of murder, rape, pedophilia, you know, all those nasty things. There are certain things Wasting the money and resources on keeping them alive in jail where they could do that to someone else in prison, you know, it's common to happen in prisons. It might be the best case to end their life and stop the chances of it happening again. Okay, so you invoked two reasons there, um, or maybe three. One of them was, look, it would be good to take a murderer, off the, a murderer, rapist, pedophile off the streets so they can't do this to other people. Yeah, that would be good, you're saying. But then you invoked kind of an economic reason, right? You said it might cost us more money to actually, like, keep somebody in prison for their whole life. Well, it costs us a lot of resources because they get free health care. They get the food. I mean, they get the living space. They get all the necessities to live for free because they have committed a crime. Okay. And there's something about that that is in principle wrong? Yeah. Or you might say it's a drain on society and it's like not cool insofar as it's that. So that's taking up jail space that we could use for criminals that maybe committed a lesser crime. Robbery. Maybe that could be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. Or they could be in jail. 
but we don't have the jail space for that now because a lot of people are in jail that maybe we should have killed. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Do you think capital punishment is justified? Or no? Yes? Um, I think it is, but I also think that um, sometimes, like, for somebody to rot in jail their whole life, it almost, like, it almost is worse than just dying right away. Okay. So, the idea there is something like, It's an easy way out. Like, like some people's punishment should be to sit in a cell for the rest of their life. Okay, interesting. So in some cases, the um, killing somebody is not the just thing to do. Maybe the just thing to do is to make them sit in a cell alone for a long time. Maybe the rest of their life. That's interesting. So the the, the argument is... Yeah, the death penalty is justified, but sometimes um, that punishment doesn't go far enough. Anybody else think that? Is killing someone sometimes, does it not go far enough for that person? What they actually deserve? Um, yeah, what, what kind of crime or crimes do you think would be deserving of that punishment? School shootings. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Yes. A lot of people intentionally cause people harm, right? <laughs> so you mean like really bad harm. Yeah. So you would say like raping a child might be deserving of death or something else like that that is that but bad? I don't think that. I feel like way worse. Way worse. Yeah. Okay, what would be worse? I, I did not think that y'all were going to say some people deserve worse. That's really interesting. How, how about torture? Should we torture some people for what they've done? Yeah. Or what crimes are deserving of torture? This is a great conversation. I'm really interested now, yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So what? Something like that. But, but I also think, too, like, I don't know, the death penalty seems like kind of like an easy way out because I know some people, especially people that are probably like, you know, in the head space to do these terrible things, probably don't care much about themselves. Okay. I, I feel like you could find a way to put them to work or make them useful. Okay. You know, just having them sit in a cell and you know, take up resources, like, I mean, maybe it doesn't sound right, but, like, there were concentration camps before. If these are people that were considering just putting to death, do we, like, it's clear that we don't care about them as, like, people anymore. It's why to make them productive. Okay, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, maybe, maybe we're wasting a bunch of opportunity by killing people. You know, does anybody know how many people die every year in the U.S. due to capital punishment? It's not that much, right? I think it's less than 50. 10,000? Is it that high? I I don't know because I I don't have the statistic. I didn't look it up. I should have. Okay. Wow. So that's. Only a thousand. It's like 50 years, yeah, 15. There were, there were 11 Tobins in 2021. Oh, yeah, it's, those people also waive their right to life Okay. Like, you can waive the right. So a lot of people are sitting waiting for the death penalty. They'll sit and wait for 
wait until they die. The people that have been put to death actually say that they want it to happen. Okay, because they don't want to sit around anymore. It says we're at the lowest rate of death penalty or of executions per year at 26.5. So this, it seems like we're doing it less and less. Yeah? Yeah. As a society? Is that a good or a bad thing? I mean, people are just committing less crimes. You think so? Is crime up or down? <laughs> well, why is that? Why is crime up? There are a lot of reasons for this, right? But Life got more expensive to live. Life is tougher. Maybe people are, you know, suffering more. Um... Certainly our education and our socialization is different than it was in previous decades. There's a lack of fear of punishment. That's what I was going to bring up. One of the things that Podgman actually talks about at the end of the article is he thinks that the scope of capital punishment should be widened. He doesn't think that just murderers or serial rapists should be murdered. He thinks maybe that hedge fund manager that screwed 1,000 elderly people out of their pensions should be put to death. So he would like to widen the scope of it. He thinks that there are some perhaps pretty common acts that people engage in in our society that are actually deserving of death. So do you think we should widen the scope of capital punishment? It seems like a lot of you are like, yeah, I'm for it in certain cases, then because people should be getting worse. Should we be saying more crimes are deserving of death and carrying that out? Sure. Or, you know, predatory organizations that go after people, get them to sign a bunch of paperwork and loan them money at exorbitant interest, interest rates. Is that bad? Should we punish those kinds of schemes with death? It would work. It's just not justifiable. Not justifiable legally, morally? Morally and ethically. Okay, so you don't think those kinds of crimes are deserving of death? So they might be deserving of death, but we as man are not allowed to give it to them because I'd say that we're only allowed to kill people in cases of, I mean, legally in self-defense. If somebody case, attacks you, yeah. For definitely, we currently use, it's a defense of our future because we're killing people that would cause more harm than good, you know? Sure. We're killing people that, if we let them out again, would murder. If we let again, let them out again, they would rape. We're defending ourselves or others from serious bodily harm or death. For some of those white collar crimes, who's going to be the person killing them? What's... Yeah. It's not ethically justifiable for that executioner because there's no harm, there's no physical harm that they're really going to cause through that white collar crime. Not directly. Not directly. Right? But look, do you screw people out of their savings? Like, that results in a lot of suffering, right? Suffering, but is it serious? At what point is it considered seriously serious bodily harm? Oh, that's another question. Yeah, should should death only be reserved for those who inflict serious bodily harm? Or would we also lump in serious psychological harm? You know, let's say somebody's going around traumatizing a bunch of people. Should we just let them, you know, keep doing what they're doing? Like 
Okay. So, so yeah, you kind of agree with his argument that this could be a good deterrent, and you agree with him that we should widen the scope of it. Do, do you agree with this first part? Oh. You'll hear conservatives and people say nowadays, oh, people don't fear the law anymore. You know, that's why they're doing all this stuff. Is that true? Are people afraid of being punished by the law in U.S. society? And if not, is that a bad thing? Should we try to change that? What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, I do think that, like, the death penalty should be reserved for, like, physical or psychological harm done to others. Okay. Because I think, like, like you said, a hedge fund manager who screws a bunch of other people out of their savings, I think you can fix that by doing something else. Um, I don't know if, like, you can really kill somebody for that, because, like, I'm sure mistakes happen, too, on that end, like, sure. you know, if you, I'm not saying, like, a thousand elderly people, like, taking their money, potentially, that's, like, something on the, like, crazy side of things, but, like, if you, like, mess up somebody's salary by, like, X amount of money, and they come after you, and say, oh, we need to punish you this much, that much, like, I feel like it opens a lot of doors. So I think it needs to be widened. Uh, there are more things than just murder, but like, I don't know how far. Maybe, maybe it needs to be widened, but maybe the burden of proof needs to be increased Yeah. for some some of the crimes that we might include within the scope of it. Yeah. Like, look, if, if that hedge fund manager, if we can show he's got emails talking to people about, yeah, I'm going to screw these old people out of their money, right? We're like, okay, we got gotcha. you. You know, like, instead, because mistakes do happen, right? We don't want to execute innocent people. And we don't want to execute people for crimes that we don't think are, well, deserving of death, right? Is there anybody here that doesn't think capital punishment is justified? Been hearing a lot from the people who are like, yeah, fuck yeah. Anybody else uh, on the other side? Okay. Is it moral for our execution to be killing them? You know, these people did nothing wrong to that person who's, you know, injecting the lethal serum or shooting them or hanging them. Yeah. They did nothing wrong to them in person. How does that affect the execution? Is it moral for them to be killing? Or would it be more moral for the victim to be killing them? Okay, that's interesting. Maybe something about justice might obligate us to, like, allow the victim to have some sort of role to Think play. Think the or... psychological harm that that would do to the executioner. If you're knowingly taking someone's life who's strapped down to a table and they can't cause you harm in any way, shape, or form, that can seriously fuck with your head. Do you know how some groups have gotten around that? The, they'll place the person who needs to be executed in front of a firing line, and they'll put blanks in five of the person's guns, and they'll put one bullet in one of the person's guns, and the people shooting them don't know who has the blank and who has the real bullet, and they all fire at the same time. And then you don't know if you're the one who killed them, right? <laughs> but that's going to keep you up at night, isn't it? I, I don't know. Maybe it would some people. Maybe. So, so maybe there's psychological harm that's produced... Because somebody needs to do this dirty job and killing people leaves a mark on you. It doesn't mean it's not justified. It just means who's going to do it. Right. And there are considerations. Right? Yeah. I, I don't love the death penalty, but I could see, like, I see reasons behind it. But I think that America has, like, too many flaws for it to be a good system. Okay. Because, because it's, like, one of the few punishments that like is completely irreversible. So yeah. and we have a court system that isn't flawless, uh, and it also there's a history of racial and economic uh, injustice that surrounds the death penalty. Sure. Um, because who's who's the guy? We were just talking about a murderer who kills someone could get the death penalty, and 
know we see famous people like I think it was the Alex Moreau or the the politician who killed his family, mm. uh, and because he was rich and powerful, and so the death penalty isn't even something that gets discussed with those cases. Or those who may have engaged in these white collar crimes, right? That knew that they were doing bad, but. You might say, where's the punishment for them, you know? Okay, so you're saying, you're saying, look, in principle it might be justified, but there's no way we're going to be able to exercise this well, like given the current state of things, like we're going to botch it. So we should just like not, not mess with it. There's also the, um, the argument that it's, if we want people to stop killing people, we shouldn't say, hey, Look what happens when you kill someone, we kill you. Like, to say that killing is wrong and your example, and to make an example of it, you kill someone yourself is... Maybe that's contradictory or weird. Maybe it sends the wrong message. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Is this an issue that you have discussed before with people? What are some of the arguments you've heard against it? Because mostly what I'm getting from y'all is, yeah. But let's have a little bit more of a balanced discussion here. Yeah, Ben. If we're willing to kill people that kill people, then we should be willing to do other things that other people do to other people. Like if someone rapes somebody, then why not we just rape them? Ah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, what do you think? Is that just or unjust? Or is that just crazy? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Might be a little wild. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to like go through all of the considerations of finding somebody to do that, finding people to do that, right? Maybe, maybe yeah, the punishment shouldn't just be, we're going to do what you did, you know, because either it's not effective or there's something off about it, or it's not universalizable, you know, there might be problems doing that. As an aside, did you know that Kant supported the death penalty? That doesn't surprise me. It's kind of a counterintuitive, surprise because he says people have intrinsic worth, right? That should be respected. We shouldn't treat people merely as objects. In a roundabout way, he says that and that what it means to respect somebody's intrinsic worth is if they've become a monster, you put them out of their misery. Because they're no longer rational, so they're no longer capable of being moral. So, little interesting tidbit for you. Would you happen to know if Aristotle supported the death penalty? Um, I don't, but I bet that he would in some extreme cases. I mean, the further back we go in history, the more the death penalty was used. That or exile, yeah. But here's an interesting question. So maybe on utilitarian grounds we can provide an argument in support of the death penalty. Maybe we can on deontological grounds as well. Kant did. What about on the ethics of care grounds? Could we say that killing someone actually is constitutive of caring for them in some rare cases? No, I feel like you have to provide like rehabilitation and like... Like that's what would it care for them? Yeah. Okay. At some point in those people's heads, there's a break. Something went wrong. There's nothing you can do to fix that maybe the ethical thing is to put them out of their misery, like you said. So in some extreme cases where people can't be rehabilitated, they can't like be. proper care does involve killing them, maybe? I mean, we've seen plenty of people, there's examples where we thought they were rehabilitated, put them back out on the street, and it happens again. Okay. Yeah. Some of those people just are broken in the head. Okay. I'll... I'll leave you with this. This is kind of an issue that people don't talk a lot about anymore. But it's something that a lot of you think 
is princi in principle might be justifiable. So if you do, do think sometimes it's just, it's right, it's defensible to kill someone on account of their actions, try to figure out where you think the limits are. The more specific and clear you can get on your own beliefs surrounding this practice, the easier it will be to talk about this with others and support it or try to undermine it if you think it's not defensible. I don't think it's wrong with the death penalty. I think like both said, it's with the United States legal system. So there's just been, there's been a dissolution of trust in our... I think we all agree that the death penalty is pretty reasonable in a lot of circumstances, but I don't think any of us have enough faith in other people to be like, oh yeah, I can let him judge that he'll... You know, die right, right. That's the issue that a lot of people have, right? They think there's something improper about letting some sort of external party decide the fate of somebody, right? Either who wasn't in the situation or perhaps they think the third party doesn't understand it well enough. Well, a lot of doing the same thing because it's like I, yeah. I noticed that there's only like uh, warrants for um, death warrants in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, and then everywhere else it's there's nothing but like you know if I had to guess most of the murders happen in bigger cities, probably about like New York, Philly, Chicago. A lot of people are arrested for those crimes, but isn't it true that the majority of homicide cases go unsolved? Was the Tree of Life Syndrome guy sentenced to death? Who? The guy who shot up the Tree of Life Syndrome. I, I don't remember. Ago? I don't know. I'm not sure. But yeah, lo look into that. I mean, you're, you would hear a lot of people probably argue that justice is not being served for a lot of the people that do these and more serious crimes. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I feel like for it to be justified, it's got to be consistent. Okay. Like, because, I mean, I, like, I, I'm not saying that, like, these state governments are going and targeting specific people. It's like, I have no opinion one way or the other, but, like, it just, it almost feels like there's something wrong there that, like, there's only some people that have put in that putting this put to death for murder and then like well the majority aren't. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah, th there are issues it would seem with how we exercise this, not only when we do it wrongly, perhaps we're not doing it enough. Um yeah, obviously the way that our society carries out justice is extremely imperfect. Right? So if we care about that, I guess we should think of ways of how we can play some small part in making things better or more just. Whatever that looks like to you. Okay, does anybody have any final questions, concerns, comments on this issue? He was in fact sentenced to death. Okay. All right, well, I'll let you all go then. Thank you for coming. I will see you on Thursday where we'll take a look at another ethical issue. And then I believe we only have a few more after that.